Welcome to the wide world of esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Today, we're talking about the business of esports strategies for success. My guest is Sharon Gill, Chief Business Strategist for Sharon Gill International. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you for having me, Catherine. <laughs> so, what does Sharon Gill International do? Well, we are a coaching and consulting company. We work with leaders and entrepreneurs um, to help them with strategies, their vision, mission, team dynamics, human dynamics. Uh, you know, we help them really to get their company from, you know, from one level to the next level. And so I work one on one with CEOs and I also work with their teams, their leadership teams. And it's just really just it's really fun and challenging at the same time. And it's, it's my life's work right now. You know, so it's really interesting to me is for the past two years, I've been interviewing many business founders, CEOs, owners in esports and gaming industry. And I've noticed that many of them started their companies during COVID. Have you noticed that? Yes, yes. And uh, you know, it's so funny. We haven't heard a good side of COVID. But there were a lot of millionaires made in, in COVID, actually, because many people went online. And so everyone, it was almost like a great equalizer, right? Because everyone was starting over. So even if you were a established company, you had to relearn the rules online. So a lot of new companies came online. And yes, it's, it's been a real uptick in businesses yeah, since, since the last two years. And a lot, of, a lot of companies have been successful, too. Sure. And so have, are, how much work are you doing with um, esports and gaming businesses? Well, I came online with ESTA um, in 2020 when the COVID happened. So Megan Van Petten, the founder of the Esports Trade Association, actually hired me because she also ran the Van Petten Group. And so they were just getting online as well. And a lot of companies were trying to figure out how to pivot to virtual. So Megan hired me to um, help with team dynamics, uh, leadership strategies, strategic direction. And it just so happens that one of her main clients, which was ESTA, Esports Trade Association. So I came on board and I helped to establish the first official board, board vetting, board training, help with a strategic plan, <laughs> help with their first event. And so that's how I got into the whole esports, you know, esports business. It was through that job, through that, through that hire from Megan Van Patten. So, and then through your work on that, have you been helping esports companies um, with their business strategy? Yes. As part of, you know, the networking, I've been able to work with other esports companies who uh, and, and let me tell you, it's the, it's the really, I don't, I don't want to come across the wrong way, but what I'm seeing in esports is because it's such a new, it's fairly new. There are a lot of content creators who are becoming business owners without business skills, right? So it's, that's a big, 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 big issue. So the esports um, companies who do hire me are people who actually have a business mind and realize that they need more help with strategy, with even their vision, their mission, their team, building out their team. Um, recently, I was working with a group of entrepreneurs in the esports space. And in talking through their challenges, I realized that half the group almost did not have a business plan. So they never thought of a business plan. Right. They never, and, and so I'm asking, how do you know how much money you need? They're just guessing. So I'm seeing this challenge in the industry where great ideas are being formed into, into companies and into businesses, but there, there's no business savvy. So that's where the opportunities are for people like myself. Um, when folks get funding, maybe the investor wants to know what is your strategy. That's kind of how I get hired because. I have to have them build out their strategy, build out their team, build out their leadership skills, et cetera. So one thing that um, ESTA has is in their conference, and I talked with James Hess about this last week, is the elevator <laughs> pitch. And so the elevator pitch 
they have to provide some of that um, business acumen and the numbers and, and, you know, kind of like what their goal and strategy is. Do Absolutely. you help them with that? Yes. So the elevator pitch is actually my baby. So I facilitated a workshop last year and this year as well. So, and this is a tremendous benefit that EST offers because it's offered free to members, right? So what I do through this eight is eight sessions, eight 75 minute session, 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 sessions. And I work with them to get their pitches from 15, 20 minutes to two minutes. So we refine and refine and refine and refine until they get to the bare essence of what they're looking for, who they are, what are they trying to do? How much money do they need? What's the story and their why behind it? And it's a really cool exercise, but in doing that, yes, I have to figure out, do you have an executive summary? Most people never heard of that. Okay, do you have a business plan? We need a business plan and then we need an executive summary. Uh, do you have a deck? And so we help them to, okay, at least get aware of what they don't have and help them to get it. As a matter of fact, my last class, I had them all work on their mission statement. And some people were advanced, some people weren't. Some people didn't have a vision statement or core value. So that was the exercise that we had in the last class. So I actually took all their mission and vision statements and I'm going to massage it a little bit for them and then present it back for them to, you know, to approve or not approve. But it was the first time some of them were thinking through even stuff like mission, vision, values, because it's all about getting that funding. But there's so much more behind getting that funding and beyond getting the funding. It's when you get the funding, how do you keep the money? How do you get the ROI for the investor? I teach them strategies and tips like stuff, you know, how to, how to look solid, how to look solid to an investor. And it's having some more business acumen. So do you feel, how do you, how do you think that those people feel when they realize, when you bring this to their attention and use acronyms and terminology that they've never even heard of? Good question. So the feedback so far has been very good. You know, um, it's almost like a business class. It's almost like business 101 or business 201 or 301. And I can, I can say in all truth, some people are really surprised about some of the things I'm saying because they really never thought of it. Um, there was this one person that was in class and I said, do you, do you have a business plan? And the person didn't have one. And I said, do you have an advisor board? And they said, yes. And the advisor board had CEOs and other business folks on it. So I said, go back to your advisor board. Maybe you should fire them because um, they should tell you you need a business plan. They're business people. But so I, I think there's a real missing opportunities, opportunity for some of these new folks coming into the business because they just don't have the business sense. Um, great ideas. It reminds me of Justin Khan, right? The guy from Twitch who had sold Twitch. And he gave this story, Catherine, about how after he sold Twitch, he thought of opening another company because he wanted to be a unicorn or a CEO. He wanted to be a CEO that you know, badly. So he got $75 million in investor money. And in the end, it all failed. And he wrote this long letter on Twitter explaining why it failed. And in a nutshell, he said, I just, I'm a content creator. I wanted to be a CEO, but I never had the knowledge. And I really burnt relationships, burnt people, burnt investors because of his own personal uh, ego, right? Of wanting to be a CEO, but not having the CEO material. And so I, and so, so he said, I'm, I'm, I'm a content creator at heart. And I find that a lot of esports businesses are, they have great ideas, but they're missing the business skills. And that's where my opportunities are to help them, you know, put the both together, get the business skill, match with their creativity and their creative ideas. And so besides what you've mentioned so far, what tips would you give to a, an esports or gaming business for them to level up? <laughs> well, 
first thing I would say is if you look at your on your team, right? If you have a team and there's no one on your team with a strong business sense, I think you should get that person on your team. If you want to invest in yourself, if you think you have the the, the bandwidth to both, you know, be the creative piece and also run it, then get a coach or a consultant. Get involved with companies like Esports Trade Association because we have educational programs. We have, you know, we have great networking, um, great connections. Get into a network so you can brainstorm with other people in the industry and maybe how they're doing running your businesses. Get some tips and strategies. Don't be a solo operator because sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Right. And so I would say get in community, get into the esports community because you don't know what you don't know. But most certainly, if you're not from a business background, you are missing. You are missing. You may get funding, but you won't be able to keep the funding. You know, that, you know, it's kind of interesting that you say you don't know what you don't know. And that, that also brings to mind this idea of being coachable and having yes. an open mind listening to the coach, because I would think that if you work with a client and they won't listen to you or they argue with you, that that doesn't help them that much. Great point. So before I work with anyone, they fill out a 15 page questionnaire. (laughs) I do, because I want to know if they're coachable, Catherine, right? So before, before I engage with any, any client, um, I have a discovery process. So we do a 30 minute call and we really talk and I, you know, I I get to hear what your big issues are, but the problems are always in the granular. So my 15 page questionnaire gets to the granular, you know, I ask about their weaknesses, you know, what's stopping them from success. What about their mindset? I, you know, I get into a lot of stuff, personal stuff, because we take our whole selves to work to our companies. So I want to get to know who you are. And that's where we start. We start at the base mindset. Are you an entrepreneur really at heart? You know, what kind of leader are you? What are your values? Because you're, you're going to run your organization based on your own value system. So we get into all of that. You know, what are you, what's your belief system? What's your vision for what you're doing? Why are you doing it? What's your why? That was a big trigger question um, I had recently in my in the elevator pitch class. I said, "What's the why?" And sure. people never thought of it. Like so, they gave me when when I first asked the question, they answered what the mission was or what they did. I said, "That's what you do." Why? And so it took us seventy five minutes to really for people really wrap their head and think about why am I really doing this. Is it for your kid? Is it because some, you know, you're affected somehow? What is your why? Because it's your why that's going to keep you there when it gets tough. Not if, but when it gets tough as an entrepreneur. Sure. And we do have a question from a viewer. And the question is, how much do you charge for consulting and classes and um, services? And so it depends on how many hours I have to work with your, with your, your team. Uh, the size of your company. So if you're a solo and it's like, this is you right now. And you're like, Hey, I just need someone to help me flush, you know, flush stuff out. Then great. Then, you know, in our discovery call, we'll, we'll talk through that. If you have a team and you say, Hey, I want you to coach me and my leadership team, then that's going to be different hours because it's some, you know, do they need individual coaching to, can I coach them in a group? You know, what are the issues? So the discovery process helped me to flush out what your needs are. And then I can quote you what my, you know, my, 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 what a project would cost. So it's three months, six months. You need me for beyond that. But usually I, I find that the minimum time that I want to work with someone is four months because at three months, they're just getting it. By month four, they've kind of got it. So by six months, they're practicing it and I'm there as accountability. Sure. So what is a common myth about the esports industry? I think one of the common myths, and I know for me that that's what it was. It's it's all gamers, and they're all in their basement, or it's kids who don't want to do their schoolwork. <laughs> it's still, you know, that that was a myth. Like esports is gaming and basement. Now, 
opening my eyes, I see the opportunities. You know, it's a it's a huge business. And the more I'm in it, the more I'm realizing how much is taken over from even traditional sports in terms of the revenue. And it's still young. It's still a young industry. And you know, so the myth that is gaming, gaming only, it's beyond gaming. When I speak to people like April Welch from IIT and hear about the educational piece that's happening in colleges and up the opportunities, it's mind blowing. Made me as a parent who did look askance at my kids when they were gaming, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Now I have a granddaughter who's on Roblox, but now I don't look at it as negative as I did when my own kids were growing up. I'm, I'm seeing it as, hey, hey, you know, it could become a career. It could become something else. So esports is not just gaming and in your basement and, you know, the loser thing. It's now really an established business and an established industry. And it's going to go really far with lots of opportunities for everyone. It's a big tent. Sure. Yeah, the ecosystem is huge. And I've learned that from all of the amazing guests that I've had on my show, from a doctor, a psychologist, to, you know, uh, uh, Jeff Weiss of Esports Circus. Um, oh, Jeffrey, yeah. one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, one of my so, favorite guys. <laughs> yeah, and you mentioned April, and she was on my show about uh, earlier in the month. She was on for Star Wars Day. So wow. uh, yeah, and there's, you know, so much, ed so many educational scholastic pieces. And then, you know, the one thing that, you know, people think of the gamer, but they don't think of that huge ecosystem that surrounds that gamer and what the potential is. I mean, whenever you have an industry, you need accountants, you need yes. um, people that service them, people who provide the office supplies and technology um, creators. So lawyers, you know, you need lawyers, lawyers. you need, you know, co co coaches and consultants. I mean, there's such, it's so huge. It's a really huge tent. You know, if you're on the outside looking in and saying, that's, that's for the game. No, you, we need lawyers, you know, you need, you know, financial people. I mean, we just had that symposium with Morgan Stanley. They're getting into the esports, you know, arena. So it's, it's a huge, huge opportunity. And it's still fairly new, fairly young. Sure. And I'm an, a member of the Esports Bar Association. So I can tell you that there's a lot of uh, attorneys that are into it. But I'm the, um, the niche that I ultimately will have. But it's kind of not, they're not ready for it yet, is mediation mm -hmm. uh, and arbitration. Because I feel like whenever you have an industry, you need people to help you solve problems and mediate disputes. And, but I don't think that it's quite there yet, but I'm ready. <laughs> That's good. That's a good air. That's a good niche for you. I think that'll be great. And I think it's coming, especially with the business that I'm seeing now, it, it, it is coming. So give it sure. another couple of years. Yeah, yeah, just a little <laughs> early, but I'm, I'm ready for that. So yeah. um, what is one thing uh, people don't know about the esports industry? Well, I think, you know, like we just said, that it's bigger than they think. It's not just isolated to gamers, that if you are, you know, what John Davidson would say, you know, non-endemic, <laughs> you know, the non-endemic folks, are, you know, are as, as important as the endemic folks. I think they need each other, right? So we have the, the what, it, what they call the, the people who are like the real insiders. And I would consider myself maybe previously an outsider, but sure. us as outsiders, like, you know, the lawyers, like yourself, myself, consultants and coaches, man, there's, again, there's a real big pie. And I even look at in the coaching space that, gee, I wouldn't have, I, there's more business than I could even, you know, handle. So there's a lot of space in this industry. Um, for for the non-endemics to really get involved and plug in and learn and embrace and adapt and, and adapt and adapt to. Sure. And so, what's the most important lesson that you've learned over the past couple of years? I think for me in business, it was you need to be agile. I saw what happened when the pandemic happened. Companies like ESTA, you know, Van Penn Group, they pivoted really quickly online. Um, Megan, she hired coaching quickly, you know, and they adapted and, you know, real quick. 
And I saw other companies really struggle with being agile, with being nimble. And it, 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 it showed me how you have to be prepared for anything, you know, uh, and, and that don't get too comfortable with what you consider to be the norm. Because what is the norm now? The norm is being redefined almost every, every six months. You know, is it virtual? Is it hybrid? Is it, you know, back to, I'm in this, you need to be nimble. Uh, and that's the biggest takeaway. I just saw what happened when companies weren't nimble, when they didn't embrace technology, when they were still waiting for, for the norm to come back and didn't act quickly enough, didn't prepare their teams for what it's like to work in a virtual environment. Big, big mistakes were made there. Big mistakes and trying to play catch up for a lot of companies were too late because they lost their employees in the great resignation who went to other companies because of they were more agile, they were more flexible with the hours. They were, you know, flexibility became huge during COVID. And if companies weren't really willing and ready to change their mindset about how business used to be done and now how it has to be done, those companies really lost out. So that was the biggest takeaway I saw for the last two years. You know, it's interesting that you talk about this change um, so recently. And I have a pretty huge business and other, you know, a lot of a big library, let's just say. And I look at my books and I think, you know, if they weren't, if they were written before COVID, how relevant are they? And do you, when you, when you think about like business books or, or books, do you have any that you would recommend that would stand the test of time um, that you think would be helpful to this audience? Yes. Um, so there's a couple. Um, there's one that I did. It's on teamwork. It's called 17 Laws of Teamwork. And that was a John Maxwell book. I really liked it because it doesn't matter if your team is in person or virtual. We still need great communication, right? Whether we're using Slack or email, you know, Zoom, you still need to have great communication skills. You still need to collaborate with your team. You know, you still need collaboration. So team dynamics is even to me now, even more of a big, big need because there's so many opportunities for miscommunication, misunderstandings, that you have to double down on effective communication in this virtual world. So I like that book, The 17 Laws of Teamwork. It's a book I'm reading right now called Traction. Traction. And it's about how to tie your business really into results and how to give everyone ownership. I really like it a lot. It talks about scorecard, having a scorecard, having everyone in the company responsible for some number, whether it's a financial number, number of calls, number of customer complaints, number of whatever, but getting everyone on your team responsible for some number in your company. I'm really learning a lot and I'm passing that on to my clients as I, as I go, because I can see the benefit of just having, you know, you know, what's going to give you traction in your organization. So all these things like, you know, how you deal with issues, how you de how do you deal with financials? How do you deal with, you know, goals? How do you deal with working in 90 day, you know, slots. It's, it's, it's just, I, I'm really enjoying that one a lot, traction. Good to know. Um, so what does your ideal client look like and how do you help them? Well, my ideal client, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a CEO, if you are a leader and you feel like you've either plateaued or you don't know how to get to your next level, or you're really having issues with your team, or you just want another partner who has been maybe in your shoe as a CEO to strategize with. Um, I'm a sounding board for a lot of my clients. Um, I, I help you navigate all of that. You know, I, I, I show up at my clients' team meetings and help run them. You know, I, I do leadership training in groups for my clients. Um, I observe and give the CEO feedback on you know, where he or she could tweak, you know, their 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 method their action their behavior so i really become a friend to that ceo and really help to co-lead and co-run their organization from the from the background sure and every um entrepreneur every ceo has strengths and weaknesses and 
Do you think it's important for people to identify what those are and then have people um, fill in and handle those areas where they're weak? Yes. And that's the reason why I like my questionnaire before I work with anyone, because I ask, what are, what are your weaknesses? And if you put none, I mean, you, you know, I'm going to ask in, the, in that first call, because you're right, all of us, I mean, I have my weaknesses. And this is the reason why leaders need to be trained how to hire right. Hire people in your weak area. Okay, so that you don't have to worry about it. Hire and delegate in your weak area. So yes, it is important that you know what your weaknesses are. Being, being self-aware is huge. You're not smart in everything. There are certain things only a leader can do. That's 5% is what I was told. 95% everyone else can do. Sure. So, yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting because my partner for North Sports Risk Management, um, we talked about that when we started to kind of revamp our organization and identify that I'm the creative person and she's the left brain person and that we would, you know, uh, essentially divide tasks um, according to our strengths and weaknesses. That's a smart strategy, Catherine, because I, I call it lanes, right? Know your lane, master your own lane, right? If I'm not creative, I don't, I'm not going to try to create something, right? If you're not the person in the numbers, don't worry about it. Let the numbers person handle it so that you can be the best 100% and 100% in your respective lanes. It's the best way to work if you're working with a partner. So do you have a productivity hack for an entrepreneur? Couple. So one is what I call Monday, right? So Sunday night before the week starts to really look at your week and plan it out. You know, put your goals down on a Sunday night. So Monday, when you get into work, Monday, you're ready. So that's, that's a, I, I really do like that Monday planning. And the second thing I like is get your mindset right. What do you need to do to get your mindset right every morning? Because we go to work and issues happen. So I like, I have a morning routine. So I get up, I do my quiet time, you know, when it's prayer, meditation, whatever. I go for a quick movement, you know, run, jog. Um, I may journal and I may do some meditation. It gets me ready to face whatever's going to come at me in the day. And the next morning I get up and I do it again. Mindset is everything. Fantastic. So um, it's been great hearing all about what you do, Sharon, and I'll give you the last word to let people know how to find you. So I'm on LinkedIn at Sharon Gill International, and I'm on my website at Sharon Gill, my first and last name, dot com. And I'm available for a discovery call free 30 minutes. Um, anyone who has an interest. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Sharon. And uh, thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Make sure to tune in next week. My guest will be Dexter Carr Jr. of G Haven Esports and Game for Good. See you then. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.